Welcome everyone. My name is Scott Beckstead. I am Equine Protection Specialist and Senior Oregon Director for the Humane Society of the United States. Uh, we welcome you to the, uh, the workshop on how to take a stand against horse slaughter. Um, if you are a Certified Animal Welfare Administrator, uh, all of the 2011 classes have been approved for continuing educa education credit by the Society of Animal Welfare Administrators. Uh, if you want more information on how to get that credit, go uh, contact uh, SAWA directly following the conference. Um, all right, uh, with, uh, without further ado. Uh, okay, so we want this to be an interactive presentation, so we're going to kind of just jump in um, as different slides pop up. And then we want you guys to kind of be involved. We want to make sure that we answer any questions that you might have or, you know, lurking issues kind of that's been talked about within your organization. So if there's anything that we're not covering, um, let us know. If there's anything in advance that you feel like we might not cover and you want us to cover, let us know that as well. Um, like Scott said, my name is Christine Sequencia. I'm Federal Policy Advisor at Animal Welfare Institute, and that's just a fancy name for lobbyists. Um, so, Nancy and I spend most all of our time on the Hill, um, usually together when we're talking about horse slaughter. We take um, tandem meetings, usually with the Humane Society, and she was with the Humane Society, I'm sure now. We're going to form an even bigger coalition with ASPCA, Humane Society, and Animal Welfare Institute. So, we're excited to continue that. Um, so, with that, we um, want you to get a real good take as to what horse slaughter means in this country, and I know that you all, most of you are very well aware of what this means. Um, but I want to warn you that our presentation is very graphic, and it shows um, several horses going through the process of slaughter. So if anybody has a queasy stomach, um, feel free to leave now. Um, so with that, um, here we go. America has a dirty little secret we need your help in exposing and stopping. Last year, over 100,000 American horses were slaughtered in the U.S. at three foreign-owned horse slaughter plants. The meat is then shipped to France, Belgium, and Japan to be served as a delicacy in high-end restaurants. America's horses endure abuse at the farm and livestock auction. Many of these horses are emaciated, injured, or sick. While the USDA reports that over 92% of the horses slaughtered are good sound horses, the abuse these animals receive at auctions and during transport has inflicted tremendous physical and mental stress, as witnessed recently at this Texas holding facility. From here, they depart for their final destination the slaughterhouse. Many are still transported on inhumane double-decker trailers, which are designed for short-necked species, where they are unable to stand normally. These horses may then spend over 24 hours without food, water, or rest as they make their way across the U.S. to facilities at the U.S.-Mexico border or in Canada. Overcrowded, stressed, beaten, and fearful, Horses are unloaded at the slaughterhouse to the overwhelming smell of waste and blood. Once inside the kill box, untrained and callous workers may often hit the horses multiple times with a captive bolt gun in an attempt to render the horse unconscious. Once the horse is down, the animal is hung by his hind leg. So his throat can be slit, leaving the animal to bleed out and eventually die. Remember, Horse slaughter is not humane euthanasia.
it is inhumane from the moment they leave in transport trucks to the moment they get inside those slaughter plants and are butchered for their meat for foreign diners. This is not an industry that Americans support, and it's time for it to end. Full digit day with a high of 101 degrees. At a Texas border crossing, this truck idles in 100 degree heat for two and a half hours until export paperwork is approved. The horse's final journey will cover some 600 miles, ending at a slaughterhouse in central Mexico. These horses are destined for a slaughterhouse in Juarez, where HSUS investigators documented just how brutally horses are killed. Here in this Mexican plant, horses are felled with a dagger to their spinal cords. Our horses are not bred, raised, or in any way intended for such a use. They all deserve a better end than to be sent to a slaughterhouse and exported for their meat to foreign diners. So now that you've seen most of the, the argument going on here, um, obviously it would be great to get a, an entire ban on slaughtering horses in general. Um, but some, some aspect of this has to do with the transport, as we already discussed a little bit. Um, so if we can make at least their transportation to a slaughterhouse humane, we've done something. If we can ban um, the profiteers of this uh, terrible industry, from you know making money on it, we've done something. So the way that they make money is by cramming these animals on double-decker trailers that are built for cattle. Um, so ban on double-decker trailers is something that we worked on last Congress and that we're working on again this Congress. Um, the ban on double-decker trailers last year was in the form of a bill started by Congressman Mark Kirk from Illinois. Um, Congressman Kirk had a double-decker trailer accident in his district 
whereby 54 draft horses, um, huge Belgian like Clydesdale animals, you probably know what these are, but we have to explain this in Congress because congressmen have no idea what you know the difference between a draft horse and a regular horse is. So we explained to them, you know, Budweiser huge draft horses were on this truck, um, this trailer that had two levels in it. Now, most double-decker trailers, we did some research and I called around several companies when we were working in this bill last year, have a ceiling clearance of 4.7 feet, okay, so I'm 5'3", so that's like right here, um, to 5.5 feet. I'm 5'3", with my heels are probably 5'9". Can you imagine a horse having to ride in something with the ceilings right here? So our, not only are they ducking their head, but I don't think I actually cover the withers of most horses. So their top of their withers is riding on the top of the um, ceiling of that truck the whole way down the road. So it's like you're bent over, and you can imagine as you're going down the road, you're not going slow, and nobody's like slowing down for a bump. I mean, you're just, you know, you can imagine how terrible that is. So we went in and explained this argument um, to several congressmen, <coughs> And we actually got some movement on this bill last year. Um, Congressman Kirk and his staff, along with uh, his Democratic sponsor, um, Congressman Cohen, the leadership never wants to bring up the other party's idea. So for them to bring up this bill in committee was huge, and we were so excited. Um, so they brought the bill up, and Congressman Cohen came up, and he gave some opening remarks, and it was just wonderful. What we saw go down in that um, committee room is something that I've never seen. And I've been around politics since 04. Um, it's not a long fantasy, but I've seen a lot um, since then, especially on this issue. And it was amazing, I'm telling you. I sat in the back row, and you know, Cohen did his five-minute speech, and then you know, the Democrats are all on one side, the Republicans are on the other, and all of a sudden, you know, Congressman Lobiondo, another Republican, starts you know talking. And you know, we did our background work. We went around to several congressmen offices and their staff and said, you know, here are some talking points on the issue. If you would like your boss to speak up, you know, this, this is the background, these are the myths and facts, this is the issue. You know, please have them use this. So we got a lot of people on it that way. But people that I hadn't even talked to spoke up on this issue. People that just saw the talking points being handed out to them five seconds before the hearing said, this is a bad idea and we need to ban it. So we saw, I mean, just popcorn effect. It was 20 minutes of people with their five minute speeches all over the party lines, you know, crossing the aisle, and then geographical boundaries too. We had congressmen in rural districts speak up in favor of the ban. Congressmen in urban districts speak up in the ban, um, in favor of the ban. So it was amazing um, to see that kind of work. And, and do you remember some of them were saying, "This is we've already banned horse slaughter." Mm -hmm. so, like they don't even know that the ban hasn't really passed. So it's always amazing to see these things. Well, it's good they they did it already. Maybe that will help. Mm -hmm. But it was it was fascinating. It was amazing. Um, something else that really inspired me in this hearing too is that this is one of the only bills that we work where we have both sides on the same issue. So the veterinary group, the ABMA, um, usually opposes us on legislative measures. On this particular bill, they wrote a fact sheet and in the line it said actively working the bill, um, which was so great that we had that piece of it. So we could go to Congressman and say, look, not only do humane groups support this, the agriculture industry and veterinarians support this as well. Um, both parties support this. So it went straight to markup. The chairman called for a vote, and it went through, and it passed with flying colors. Um, so we were so excited to see that. The only opposition that we saw was from the rodeo team. Okay, The rodeo association issued a press release two days before um, saying that they had some folks that specially modified trailers. So they said that they had literally five, not five types, okay, but just five rodeo trailers that had been modified to have a double level on one part of the trailer and then a single level on another part of the trailer. Um, they also said that they modified some to where the belly of the trailer, you know, between the wheels had been expanded. So they're saying that this is now humane and horses can ride in the belly of this trailer that has been expanded. They said it's 71 inches. Okay, nobody really knows, can be quick now. What is 71 inches? It's five feet 11 inches, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so five feet 11 is still not tall enough for any average horse that stands, a 15 hand horse, by the way, is exactly seven feet with its you know, head standing up straight. Seven feet, still not enough. What happened in the hearing, Thompson Boswell from um, Iowa, brought up um, 
kind of an ending idea saying, you know, can we give some respect to these guys who've tried to modify their trailers? The chairman was open to that. Um, we wanted to talk about it as well. If you've actually figured out a way to do this humanely, we would be open to that. Although we knew that the physics of this would not allow a trailer um, to be formulated in a way that it would be humane for, for horses. So um, we listened to their arguments. The chairman is, listened to Boswell's argument and said, okay, if you can prove to me, if you can get me the stats and the figures and the measurements on these trailers, we'll look at it. So usually when a bill passes with flying colors um, on a voice vote, the report is issued right away and then the bill is, um, goes to the floor for floor action. In this case, they gave the rodeo people two weeks to respond to the chairman's request for more information on those trailers. They held the report open for two weeks and the rodeo people never responded. So whether they couldn't come up with the facts or they realized that their trailers were actually inhumane, um, I don't know. But at any rate, um, the report was closed and the bill didn't end up going to the floor because what we saw in the election was a complete dysfunctional turnaround of the party. Um, so we're hoping that is now a senator, Mark Kirk from Illinois. So now we have Senate support um, and we're working on trying to get support in the House again so we can have two bills and pass them at the same time. That's what's going on. Um, with this bill. So like I explained, um, the ban on double-decker trailers provides humane equine transport. This is kind of a graphic we put together for the hearing that I explained um, that shows that regular, this is, you know, I think I reported more, it's 15 hands high, stands seven feet tall. As you can tell, it's head poking through the top of that ceiling. Um, and these are the measurements for the specially modified rodeo trailer that's supposed to fit in, you know, an equine. Obviously it doesn't. Um, so the AVMA in their paper, the reason why they supported this bill, they actually recommended that horses have an eight foot ceiling clearance. So um, obviously the seven feet, you know, just to clear the animal's head and then, you know, obviously you get another foot for road dumps or whatever, what have you. Um, so they recommended eight feet and that's why they supported this bill as well. Um, something else that kind of really helps our argument here is that U.S. law requires that urban and rural bridges meet um, a 14-foot uh, bridge height. Now, I live in Old Town, Alexandria. It's George Washington's hometown. So this was you know, built way back when, and bridges in my area are just 14 feet. Um, so you can imagine if you need, if you have a seven-foot horse, and then another seven-foot layer on top of that, that's already 14 feet. And you're not even talking about clearance for the wheels or you know, underneath, or bridge clearance. Um, so it's just impossible to build a trailer that would be humane. So that really worked in our favor. Next, um, so USDA regulations already address the issue of transport. This kind of helps get us a lot of support, especially Republican support, because when you say you know, the USDA already recognizes that this issue exists and they're taking um, steps to try to help. The only thing is the way the regulations are written. This is from a 2002 document where the USDA finally got around to issuing regulations after they were ordered um, in an authorizing bill, 1996 Farm Bill, they were authorized to issue regulations on double-decker transport. What they came up with is after five years, the use of double-decker trailers for com commercial transport of equines to slaughtering facilities would be banned. Um, this was written in 2002, so out of 2007, it should be effectively banned. However, we've never seen um, those official regulations come out. So that's why we need to have a bill, a uh, federal bill. Um, this is something that is near and dear to my heart. My brother is a firefighter. He was a firefighter in Texas um, in a rural town of Frisco. Well, it was rural until four years ago when they decided to pop up little shopping centers all over the country. But, um, he is uh, a firefighter now in D.C., and being in both places, he's never been trained on um, how to handle animals in distress. They do not carry drugs on their ambulances or fire trucks to handle animals in distress. They don't carry anything to sedate an animal, to euthanize an animal. Um, they have no idea, but they have to respond to the emergency. So if my brother were to show up on a scene of any of these uh, accidents, his life would be in danger, even more than it already is. He just got engaged, so his fiance Madison already has enough to worry about. He works 24-hour shifts every three days. So can you, can you imagine any um, fiance or girlfriend or wife of somebody who's a first responder having to sit at home and wait 
while their husband, boyfriend, doesn't respond to their text messages because they're working. I don't think that we need to give them anything else to worry about here. Um, these guys already have enough on their plate, and they don't need to respond to preventable accidents. So that's one thing um, I think that really resonates in Congress when we talk about a ban on more slaughter um, or a ban on level deck of trailers. We don't, you know, we don't need to endanger those, those people. Um, the pictures that you see here are um, screenshots from a video that I'm about to show you about um, an accident that happened in Missouri where a double decker trailer tipped over and um, you'll see that scene that, it, that ensues, but these are first responders responding to that accident. And those horses were on route to slaughter. Yeah, they're on route to slaughter. Um, this is sort of the same thing. The point in this slide is that um, you know, there are so many, there's a limited amount of funds that go to animal issues. I heard a fact yesterday, Jack, I think it was you who actually brought it up, could be wrong, that said that less than 2% of charitable funds in this country um, go to animal issues. Now, I'm sure that several of you are involved in a nonprofit and you are in constant fundraising mode, um, and you don't want any of that money to go to an issue that could have been prevented. Why do we need to put more money towards first responder retirement funds or you know, disabled first responders because of accidents that happen that could have been prevented. Why don't we just stop this all together and make sure that those funds that are available go to issues that, um, that we need them to go to. So here's a video that I was talking about um, from Missouri. It's no slaughter footage. On no slaughter footage. It's about five minutes long. It just shows um, the accident scene and it shows uh, first responders responding to the accident and it has a great um, narrative by a veterinarian. In the very early morning hours of September 27th, a double-decker trailer carrying 41 horses and a hinny overturned on Interstate 44 near Stanton, Missouri. This is the story of tragedy, heroes, survival, and hope. My pigeon went off about 3.45 in the morning. I rushed to the scene as quick as I could and uh, kind of, you know, panicking the whole way, thinking, how are we going to, you know, how are we going to help all of these horses that are trapped in this trailer? I know a semi truck. I'm familiar with them, but to see it laying on its side and knowing all those horses are in there, it was. Um, I was a little overwhelmed at first. When I got there, it was it was worse than I could have imagined. I quickly climbed up on top of the trailer. I had to climb up on the on the wheels of the trailer and get up on top, which was now the side of the trailer. But um, and I could look down into the trailer. And it was, it was really horrific. Just, you saw horses up, horses down, horses tangled. I cannot even tell you how many were where. I mean, they were just in there piled on top of each other, struggling, and some of them had their foot down in the ventilation holes, you know, stuck, um, just crunched up against the walls, kicking each other, trying to stand up. The fire department was there, and I think uh, there was a couple of the uh, emergency response team that specializes in large animal rescue, and these people came so well prepared. It was really a blessing. The firemen were just amazingly fearless in helping these animals. Several of them was, well, they was all cut big time. So, you know, I don't know what. <laughs> I, I don't know. I just, it's. Uh, there's not a day goes by I don't think about it. There was one horse that was, uh, and we named him Willie because he is amazing will to to survive through this whole whole ordeal. But he was trapped under two dead horses, and I was standing next to the fireman, and we were we could only see through the wall. There was only about a two-inch strip that we could see through the wall. The only reason we knew he was alive because we could all we could see was his eye, and his eye was blinking. And we thought, oh my gosh, this horse is alive. And we finally got this door open, and uh, we had to drag this this dead horse over Willie. We freed him from that horse, and we freed him from another horse, and uh, and he. We had to drag him out of the trailer and, and you know, all the way out onto Interstate 44, right in the middle of Interstate 44, and we put a catheter in him and started running fluids, and 
And uh, I went back in the trail and I came back about a half an hour later and he was up and standing. I couldn't believe it. And, uh, and you know, he's doing quite well and he's got a lot of injuries, but he's doing really well. And the scene, uh, we, we treated about, I think it was about 26 horses. It might have been 27. We quickly uh, bandaged them, stopped bleeding, you know, kind of, you know, did it what we could, got them on another trailer and got them to a triage site. It was so chaotic that we had to uh, spray paint the horses to identify who had been treated, what they had had, uh, where they were going to go, and, and uh, uh, some of the horses we sprayed with H, and that meant that that horse was critical and needed to go to a hospital. The first day was probably the most critical day. They were all in, in really bad shape. I mean, they had been through a lot. And it was, it was really kind of amazing because just over 24 hours, they all started looking a lot better. I mean, they, they did the next day, they really had kind of, some of them had really turned the corner. Nutrition is really important with these guys because all of them probably hadn't eaten for a couple days, uh, it, you know, maybe even before this. We didn't know where the horses had come from, how long they had been on the trailer. We immediately had to, you know, get the best nutrition in them that we could. Sometimes in tragedy, we discover strength we never thought we could find and skills we never knew we possessed. And most importantly, we discover the power of friendship and caring. They never let us down, and they never let the animals down. And as these horses lay in a trailer on the highway, some dead, some dying, they were already responding. People showed up with trailers to see if they could help. And we had skilled professionals, we had, we had veterinarians, we had farriers, we had horse handlers that came out and couldn't have done the rescue without them. So that's the scene of one of the accidents. Um, as you can tell, it's graphic and um, terrible. I need to make sure that it stopped, no matter where those horses are going, especially if you're going slow. Um, so what are we doing? Um, this is what I already told you about. This is the bill from last year, H305, not to be confused with 503. At least we'll have different bill numbers this year, so it won't be as confusing. Um, and then this Congress, like I already told you, we're hoping to get Senate action from the sponsor who was in the House last time, um, and then hope to get a, a House sponsor to bring it up. So um, we're expecting that to happen in the next couple of weeks, actually. So you guys keep in touch with our um, different organizations, web pages, and news alerts to make sure that you know when that happens. Um, appropriations, what Nancy talked about earlier, um, is a section that um, we try to use other than a, uh, authorization bills so that we can you know, try to stop this. She already spoke to this um, bill a little bit, but the appropriations defund language, which defunds those horse uh, inspectors and horse slaughter plants, is effective right now, but only by the hair of its chinny chin chin. So every year we have to come around and make sure that the language is in the appropriations bill again. So we don't currently have slaughter in this country, but we could. Um, and it got a little bit scary actually last year when this dysfunction in Congress came around and they couldn't pass the budget. Who remembers um, hearing that the government was going to close down? Anybody? Yeah? So uh, that's great. The government's going to close down, but guess what else happened? Our language is dead in the water at that point, too. If they don't pass the appropriations bill, our language doesn't have anywhere to go. So, so what happened was they, um, they passed a thing called the CR, which is an extension of uh, language from the previous year. So our language is still in there defunding horse slaughter, um, plant, horse slaughter inspections at this point. But it could be gone at any minute, at, you know, at any year, if we don't watch it. Um, so we are actually simultaneously now working on FY12, we do it a year in advance, um, and so we're trying to make sure that that language stays in again this year while trying to find a way to, you know, to introduce the bill on horse, the horse slaughter ban. So we're busy. <laughs> um, um, the other appropriations uh, situation that we have is concerning wild horses. Um, wild horses is a whole other issue in and of itself, and we can do an entire workshop just on the wild horse issue. But um, this is something that we want to bring up because it also um, basically bans the slaughter of wild horses that are captured by the BLM so that they cannot be slaughtered. Um, and this language is, again, something that we have to come back to every year to make sure that that language stays in those, in those appropriations bills. And so 
we were happy to see it maintained in the um, in the CR decision that was passed uh, last two weeks ago. I can't remember two or three weeks ago. And then now we're working on it again in FY12 here. You have to understand the nature of a lobbyist job is not so exciting all of the time. So, so I mean we. I, we have meetings, three or four meetings every day, saying the same thing, going through the same arguments, and hardly ever see anything happening, so you never get a pat on the back. But to go to Illinois um, and work a state bill was so fun. So it's completely different than the U.S. Congress, whereby you can just stand on this thing they call the rail and send your card into the House floor, and all the congressmen are actually present, where they are not in the U.S. House. Um, and the congressman will come out and talk to you personally, just because you said your card in. So it's really fun um, to go to the state and lobby. I was so excited to do that. While I was standing on the rail waiting for a congressman to come out, the governor of Illinois, um, Governor Quinn, came out. He was about to give his budget address. And he reaches over and he shakes my hand. And he's like, what are you here for? And so I'm like, quick elevator speech. I'm in Welfare Institute. We're here to try to stop this bill that would reopen more slaughter plants in the state. Now, you guys know Nancy talked about earlier that Illinois is the only state to actually uh, ban slaughtering horses at that time, 2005, when we're trying to do this. So to reopen a horse slaughter um, plant in that state would be ridiculous because they had this huge deal, this huge vote to stop it at that point. Um, so this congressman, Congressman Seisha, reintroduces this bill every year to reopen horse slaughter in the state. And we worked tirelessly. I was up until 2 in the morning doing whip counts, um, creating fact sheets, you know, and then standing on the rail, talking to every congressman that I could find. Um, but I wanted to show you a video of that going down. Now, I wasn't supposed to be filming. I was sitting up in the gallery above what was, what was happening. So the video is kind of shaky. So let me explain what's going to happen. So um, the guy, Congressman Seisha, is going to be standing right here. And he's going to talk about how, you know, We've got these animal groups that stop this way, you know, this slaughtering horses. Now, at this point, um, all of our speakers on this bill are standing in the back two rows, and you're going to see a guy with a bald head. Now, he's Congressman Fritchie um, at the time. Now, he's Cook County Commissioner <coughs> in Chicago, and he um, is an avid supporter of animal issues. He actually received the Humane Society Award in the state for being so great on it. But anyway, you'll see him, and he's like pacing back and forth, waiting for Congressman Seisha to shut up so that he can start off with all those talking points that he has in his hand. And behind him are two colleagues, and on the other side of the aisle um, are two colleagues that are like ready to speak up in favor. Um, so watch what goes down. I cannot even begin to imagine the amount of letters, emails, contacts that have come to you about what a horrific idea this is to allow the humane end of life to horses in this country. I have in front of me an article that all of you received yesterday and the day before from the Animal Welfare Institute stating, among other things, that the captive bull method of termination for a horse is very inhumane. Because of the political reality of how this affects some of you. I am asking Mr. Speaker to pull the bill from the record for the following reason. The Senate has put a brick on the bill. It isn't going to move when it comes out of the House. Why should I do that to you? Why should I ask that of you? Mr. Speaker, I ask you to pull the bill from the record. Amazing. We were ready for an all-out war. We had all of our guys, our soldiers lined up, they had their talking points, Congressman Fritchie's pacing back and forth, and all of a sudden he says, I pulled the bill from the record, we're not bringing it up. Um, we were shocked and so excited. Apparently what we've done all week long, all night long, talking to everybody we could, we could talk to worked. Um, my whip count at the end was 77 to 42, um, which means that he would have absolutely not had the votes. He would have even been close to his votes. And this was just a play into his constituency to try to get reelected to say, oh, that he tried to do it. But he was nowhere close um, to making this happen, and we were so excited. What happened this year? Um, he didn't even bring up the Yeah, several of you are actually um, in our Homes for Horses Coalition conference this week, so um, thank you for doing that. Um, for those of that, you who are not involved in Homes for Horses, let me tell you what they do. So it was a coalition formed by the Animal Welfare Institute and the Humane Society of the United States.
to form an umbrella group for rescue so that you guys could communicate with, with each other, um, to form a network so that you could um, you know, share ideas and figure out best practices for running rescues. Um, so they provide a network of, of horse rescues. Um, it addresses the horse, horse, unwanted horse myth, which was something that just was coined by our opposition, actually. We don't feel like there are any unwanted horses. Um, um, but so it addresses the unknown horsemen. It ensures validity of rescues through GFAS accreditation. Now, not all rescues that are involved in this umbrella group are GFAS accredited, but actually um, more and more of them are getting accredited. And that just says, you know, this rescue was run by the right people. It is um, doing best practices. It is making sure that everything's humane, um, that it has the right and proper facilities to do this. Um, so we're hoping that, you know, through um, getting the word out there and providing resources and um, information on how to get grants, we can get more and more of those rescues GFAS accredited. Um, allows for community outreach through social media pages. I know we have some people in the room who are great at this. Um, and we, if we have some time, I want to get um, Joe's take on what she's been doing. Joe Dial um, runs Rescue Angel Acres and is just all over Facebook and does some great work um, on social media. And she you know, has the help of Homes for Horses Coalition to get everybody else involved in what she's doing as well. Um, provides a continuous education. We are in the middle of our conference right now. Yesterday we had a workshop um, which we brought up speakers on grant writing and um, several other things. And then tomorrow we're going to continue that. So, continued education. Now, how are you guys going to get involved? So we've talked about how difficult it is to work these bills. Um, um, this is a trailer from the movie Thank You for Smoking. I don't know if any of you have seen this, but it's a lobbyist dream movie. It's hilarious. Um, what goes down in this particular trailer is that um, the lead actor is a lobbyist for the tobacco industry. Now, the tobacco industry, I like into the big agriculture industry, um, but they have so much money that they can come in and just override any other uh, credible issue. Um, so Big Ag has a ton of money, they have a big infrastructure, they have big support, they even have their own committee, the Agriculture Committee. So we need your help on the floor um, to make sure that money doesn't talk to these congressmen when they're thinking about re-election, that votes talk to them. But this is kind of a play on what we're dealing with. So funny though, um, and that's exactly what we deal with. So we have a couple of lobby pointers for you.